I have one question. What will you do with your next 48 hours? How about generating an idea that has the potential of changing the world? At Texas A&M University and the College of Engineering, we believe engineers build things. But I believe every great idea starts with an intensive innovation experience that is all-consuming, frustrating, elating at the same time. While a project may take months or years to complete, that intensive innovation experience that you start with will lead you through the rest of the time that gets you there. Let me explain a little bit how I got involved in this, why I think it's important, and some of the results that we're seeing. How about that? Very early in my career, young engineer, it was one of those kinds when there was no boundaries, inspiring. We were able to do anything that we wanted to. So this was very young, and there was no possible way that we could fail. We were all creative. All of us design engineers want to do something. We want to build something that makes a difference to other people. This was back in the 1980s. The internet was just starting. Video streaming was just a dream. No one ever had it. We were able to connect computers at the amazing blinding speed of 300 characters per second. Now we get incredibly frustrated if we can't connect at a million times that rate. There was a brand new technology being developed. It was called fiber optic transmission. And this promised to be able to allow us to send a tremendous amount of data long distances. There was a problem. There was no standard interface for fiber optic transmission. That's like having a computer with a Wi-Fi interface that can't connect to anything, or having to carry a cell phone, a different cell phone, for every city that you visit. That would be chaos. It's bad enough that we have to carry a bag now with different connections for video and power. So, I was assigned to be part of a two-person team to solve this problem. We had no clue how to solve it. The project was looming over us. It was a huge issue. We were in a meeting with some people from ITT, and they started talking about a concept of how to organize photons on a fiber. It was as if a lightning bolt hit us. Yao Chao Ching and I immediately to catch our flight, went back to the airport, and what did we do? Sounds cliche, but we went into an airport bar, grabbed a napkin, and started drawing. What is it about airport bars, napkins, and beer? I believe there's innovation there someplace. In the next 48 hours, we put together the basics behind a fiber optic transmission standard called Sonnet. This is one of the early documents that was published according, uh, describing Sonnet. In the middle of this document, you'll see that there are notes in it. Well, that's because I couldn't spell at the time. I'm an engineer. And I didn't realize that a poem or a song that was called a sonnet had two ends in it. We just wanted to stand out, so we put notes up there. Eventually, the sonnet interface became an international standard responsible for billions of dollars of equipment per year. If you use your cell phone, if you search on the internet, you live stream video, you are using equipment that has sonnet interfaces on it. I remember this as being one of the most inspiring and elating times of my career. And it happened very early in my career, which really got me nervous and made me sad because I was afraid it was never going to happen again. My career continued through product management, sales and marketing, business development and manufacturing, and it never happened again. In 2012, I joined Texas A&M University in the College of Engineering. And at that time, my job was to try to help engineers have design experiences, and use my skills to do that. 
we were approached by some people from Motorola to try something brand new. They wanted to bring a van full of rapid prototyping equipment to the university and engage some students in something, an experiment. The Make With Moto team was a six-person creative team. They engaged 20 different Texas A&M University students in an intensive design weekend. Those students were from freshmen to PhD candidates, and it allowed them to have a diverse skills and diverse backgrounds. I now saw what was possible, and it rekindled all the passion that I had felt so early in my career. With that new energy, we created a program that we call Aggies Invent. Aggies Invent is a 48-hour intensive design experience where we gather 60 to 70 students from PhDs to freshmen, from all different kinds of majors, and all different skill backgrounds and all different experiences together in a single spot. We seed that event with need statements, design challenges, that come from industry and agencies, things that need to be built. Students then form teams around those ideas. They then spend the next 24 to 48 hours designing and building and selling this. We go through four phases. We call it the dance, where the teams are forming. Designing, where you use an engineering design process to design something. Then the doing, building it. Then we sell it. We do this in a 20,000 square foot rapid prototyping lab that has every kind of modern rapid prototyping equipment in it that we can think of. This is a picture of some of our best equipment. <laughs> Notice modeling clay, string, scissors, duct tape, the ever-present duct tape. What would the world be without duct tape? Now. We move as quickly as we can from this kind of equipment because we push low fidelity prototyping. How can you build something as fast as you can? We move quickly from duct tape to drill presses, from scissors to CNC mills, from modeling clay to 3D printers, and from string to electronics. All of this is done in an open environment where students get a chance to create and build whatever imagine, they can imagine. However, the most important asset that walks into this lab every day are the students. The students come in inspired. They come in anxious. They come in ready. They come in believing that everything is possible. And because of that, they do the impossible every day. We've held nine, eight Aggies events so far. In fact, the ninth one is going on right now. There's 40 students about 1,000 feet from here, and they are designing solutions for first responders. We've learned a few things over the time. Let me carry on and show you a little bit of the things that we've found. First, it requires a spark. In our case, we use need statements, things that people need us to develop. This is not unlike the spark when Sputnik was launched that helped inspire a nation to eventually land men on the moon and to carry beyond the Apollo program. It's that spark that causes everybody to start thinking and designing. Understand the problem. We start with a paragraph or a written statement, but you have to go much deeper. You have to understand more about what that problem actually is. Just because it can be built doesn't mean it should be. So how can you take those ideas, those sparks, and generate and build the next best thing? Small teams are critical. We've found that four to six students of varying skill levels, of varying majors, of varying experiences are in critical to this process. Teams of less than four don't have enough diversity in them to be able to make it worthwhile. Teams larger than six start to suffer from team dynamics where you have issues with trust and communication and intimacy. 
that don't allow those teams to have high performance goals. Build something. Build a physical solution as fast as you can. Because when it becomes physical, then it becomes real to everyone. Even software requires a physical solution. So build it fast. And then tear it up and build it again. Because the second and third iteration are actually the best. We keep those first iterations so that we can show people how they've evolved over time. Deadlines are critical. I don't know about you, but I know I'm motivated by deadlines. If there's not a deadline in my horizon, I probably won't get it done. So we create deadlines in the middle of these experiences so that teams know where they are, know how they're progressing, and know that they're moving towards that goal. Those deadlines are absolutely critical. Then sell it. Any great idea will die on the vine if you're not able to get that idea into other people's minds and convince them that it's important to them in their words. We found a 10-minute presentation with a 90-second video to be the best and most effective way to communicate ideas. Competition spurs innovation. It spurs focus. It spurs everyone in that competitive spirit. This is a competition. The monetary amount sometimes doesn't make any difference, but it does help. Think of how the X Prize has helped spur the competition that has generated commercial space flight, or the DARPA self-driving vehicles has spurred an entire industry in self-driving cars. Competitions provide that focus. Oh, and there's one more thing that we found absolutely critical in any intensive design experience. It is food and coffee. It takes a lot of food to keep that energy level up for people to go throughout the night and to break through all of their problems. Now, students have told us that these experiences have been transformational to them. However, we wanted to illustrate three of the 70 teams that have been through this so far to show you what they're coming up with. The first team I want to highlight was one of the teams from our first Aggies event. And it was designed, uh, the need statement was given to us by Baylor, Scott, and White. This team was to design something that would detect an infant left in a hot car and rescue it. Their first question to us was, if you saw a baby locked in a hot car, would you break the window to rescue it? And everybody, of course, said yes. We want you to be part of our Good Samaritan network. So what did they do? They took sensors and they detected when the baby was left in a hot car. They would text the owner of it and tell them, you left the baby in a hot car. If you didn't hear back from that person in two minutes, then what happened is they used a technique called geofencing, and they checked, texted everyone in the Good Samaritan network within a kilometer, the GPS location of that baby to go rescue it. They did this in 48 hours. The next team. Team Vapor Space. The challenge was given to us by the world famous Fireman's Training School here at Texas A&M University. Did you know that hazmat suits don't have any pockets? I didn't. And it turns out that when a firefighter or a hazmat team rolls out, they have to have very specialized tools. Well, there's no way to carry all of the tools that they need. They have to have a toolbox. So this team was challenged to integrate the, the tools that these hazmat teams need to be able to carry with them into a single tool. In 48 hours, they put them all together, they did a prototype, they took it out to the fireman's training school, and the firemen used it, and while you can't see it behind the masks, they're all smiling broadly. This team filed for provisional patent and is continuing to develop this tool again inspired in 48 hours. The final team I want to highlight is a team that was challenged by Texas Children's Hospital to design a detection for dehydration. The team was made up of, again, a wide variety of, of students with very diverse backgrounds. They found out that the second leading cause of infant death worldwide is dehydration. Why? 
Babies can't tell you they're thirsty. It's the second leading cause of death. What they did was they integrated a salinity detector inside a pacifier and then put a Bluetooth onto it such that that pacifier was able to detect the salinity of saliva and then an app that shows people that this baby needs to have additional water. This team is filing for patent and continuing on and continues to develop this as well. Each one of these teams started in a 48-hour intensive design experience with the inspiration of a spark to get them going. Now while Aggie's Invent has been successful here at Texas A&M University and it continues, we're going to continue doing this, we know that this program is going to be able to expand. We built on the scaffolding that provide, was provided by Motorola to start this intensive innovation experience and added our own ideas. What we want to do is for others to take this program, take this scaffolding, take this framework and build on it. We're going to use it, you invent, where you change the you to whatever it makes sense in your university and build upon this and then help us. Tell us what you've learned. Tell us what you have determined your best practices and help us make it better. Not only that, our goal is to give this kind of experience to students at all level, from elementary through PhD. Because we've seen the excitement, we've seen the elation, we've seen the creativity, we have seen what it will do and how transformational it can be in a student. We're modifying the program and we're in the process now of determining the best ways that we can give intensive innovation experiences at all levels to all students because it can make a huge difference. I started this talk with saying engineers build things. And that's true. We do. We build things. But sometimes we'll build something that nobody wants. So it is actually when you add in the art, the business, and the science into that picture that gives you the opportunity to make sure that you're building something and innovating something and have the ability to make something worthwhile. It is at the intersection of innovation, of those circles that true innovation happens. Let me remind you of my first question. What will you do in the next 48 hours? We want you to help us join this and help us expand the program and take an intensive innovation experience that could change the world. Thank you.